can be hard when you grow up People feel you with doubt You start thinking about what you're gonna do now And it's do or die Gotta make it count So lose your worries Let your problems go on Until my whole body burns out I ain't never gonna slow down Welcome everyone, this is Coaching in Session. My name is Michael Reardon and I will be your mindset coach today. And today we're gonna to be talking about what is going on with your sleep. You are not sleeping the best you can. And you might think that, oh, it's old age. Oh, it's, I'm so busy, I'm so stressed out. We understand, I understand that you're gonna have moments when you're not gonna be able to sleep. Maybe you are in college, you have a paper, an all-nighter, and you decide to wait for the last minute. Hey, I'm guilty of that too. This is just reality. Some people procrastinate. Some people are just going to exasperate some of the issues that they're having in their life. Most of the problems that we have today when it comes to sleep are going to be self-induced. That means you are the problem. Just because most of the problems that we get are self-induced, maybe be our smartphone, maybe be our habits, it could be a whole plethora of things. We need to start to ask the question, well, what can we do about it? And for the people who don't do anything about it, they're going to be those people who are tossing and turning and they're trying to find a way out. But what typically tends to happen to these individuals is they look for the band-aid approach to fix it. Oh, I can't sleep. Let me get some z Let me get some melatonin. Let me get something that's just going to make me fall asleep because I'm so tired. I'm sick and tired of being tired. Why are you doing the things that are continually making you more tired. How to get tired, how to get the good sleep that you need. All of this is going to be answered in today's episode because we do have to look at the underlying issues that a person can be dealing with, facing, and then what they're doing about it. So we're going to be having a sleep expert come on. He is a medical doctor and he helps people get the best night's sleep possible. He's going to be looking at how he can be of benefit to you to make sure that you get the best night's rest and that you get back to the sleep patterns and cycles that you should be having. So here's that interview with my guest, Dylan Petkus. Welcome, Dylan Petkus, to Coaching In Session. How are you doing today? I am doing well. How about yourself? Doing well. Thanks so much for coming on. Today, we're going to be talking about your work. You are a medical doctor, and you do have a focus on sleep. We are going to be having a conversation on sleep today because sleep is one of those important things that many people are giving away to their smartphones, to the televisions, maybe to a career. And if they gave a little bit more focus in sleep, they can maybe get more energy in their day, more focus in their day, which is going to most likely help them along the way. But I do want to get a perspective of what you do and how you help the world. Yeah, so how I help people is when, I mean, they just come to me, they are just big, big exhausted. I mean, you know, it's great superlative adjectives there. But like, they're just completely run to the ground. They're just like at a low point in their energy and sleep is usually a really big part of that picture of where they're just either not getting enough quantity, maybe they do get the quantity, but their quality is just awful. And things are just completely falling apart, whether it's insomnia, sleep apnea, you know, we really focus on people and helping them restore their sleep. Now, if someone has like brand new baby puppies, can't help you, sorry, but more of those like health medical uh, aspects, that's what really we specialize in. And how we do that, uh, just briefly, because obviously we'll dive into this more, you know, revolving around like natural lifestyle changes, because, you know, when we think about it, we have some like really basic human functions, right? Like walking, breathing, blinking, listening to podcasts, but also sleep. Like sleep is like the most basic thing for you not to be able to lay down and sleep and like turn off. Like you're just programmed by evolution to do so. It says a lot about you and your health. It's a big serious issue here to be addressed. That's why we really target it and get people into a good natural alignment. So that's working again. 100% agree with that because people do have a hard time disassociating with busy time being awake with going to sleep. And as you said, there's going to be things like outside of your control. My friend, for example, he has two new puppies. As you said, you can't control that. I remember when I was a teacher and I got my dog, it was like I was coming in to work and everyone was like, are you okay? 
And I'm like, I got a puppy. And they're like, oh, but then it's the same thing if you have a kid. It's the same thing maybe if you have a stressful job. So we have these circumstances or factors that we kind of have to put into, I guess, the formula to how can we get good sleep if we have such a busy life and if we have these outside factors? Are the ways that people can start to get better sleep, even if they are in a stressful job, if they have a lot of anxiety, if they have kids or dogs, is there a way that you have found that can help people start to sleep better and maybe put those worries and things they have to do, the obligations to the side? Well, yeah, I mean, it really depends on what the problem is, right? Because trying to improve sleep generally is like trying to improve life generally. You need to get specific, right? So like specifically, if someone is having whether anxiety, like you said there, okay, being able to help calm down, being able to have protocols in place for that. But like, you have to first get really real, real and isolated on the what the issue is here. Because a lot of times we just kind of float around in generalities. Because a lot of times it's not really rocket science. A lot of times the people already have insights. They're just not really accessing it, right? Because, you know, when you had your puppy, I'm sure the problem was, you know, being able to have a, a nighttime schedule that was conducive, right? You know, but there's only so many things to do about that. But how did you address it? Whether it was like, I don't know, coffee, whether it was just kind of pushing through, you need to be able to have kind of a, not like sideways lateral answers. Okay. You need to be able to kind of hone in on the thing. So I mean, if there's more specific thing, because I mean, there's like 30,000 different things that could harm sleep. But in terms of like a, a more specific one, we would need to pick one and just kind of go from there. Well, let's do a common issue. And typically a common issue that many people struggle with is technology. I love talking about technology with sleep because it does take away a lot of hours of sleep. If we think about it, it's so addictive. You can sit down on the sofa, it's easy. You can be on your smartphone before you know it. It's already one, two o'clock in the morning and you're just like, whoa, like I just lost all this sleep, but maybe you were having fun. Maybe you're trying to unwind, de-stress. It can maybe be a good thing, but the next day, now we suffer, right? Because now we're trying to push through the day. As you said, we might need caffeine and energy drink and those things are going to eventually wear and tear down on the body. Now, if you're young, it might not be a big problem in the beginning, right? Think of college, going through med school, I'm sure. You probably had long nights and you just like, all right, I have to deal with this. Versus an older person, maybe in their 40s and 50s, they are going to wake up, they are going to be lethargic, they're going to get that coffee, espresso, whatever, but yet their body can't bounce back as readily as someone who's young because maybe it finally has caught up to them in the later ages versus when you're young, all night or here and there is very different than if I decide to make a lifestyle of not getting adequate sleep. Let's start to separate it by age. Let's start to look at the youth first. Do you see an issue with the youth having problems sleeping or wanting to sleep? They're really bad. They're worse than ever. Uh, awful. Like, are we saying youth is less than 18? Is that our line? In the same yeah. Line? And, and, and I mean, we can go even early 20s. Okay. So it is worse than ever, worse than it will ever be. I, I mean, okay, it probably continue to get worse, to be honest. Because like, I mean, if you look at like a medical school class, because like one time, like, and that'll typically be people who 21 through 25 or 20. Okay, that's 21 to 25 is a good range. These are people who, you know, ostensibly to get into medical school, you have to be pretty high functioning. <laughs> in many ways it's not like studying for art class um now i'm not artistic in any way i'm not downplaying that but i'm just saying there's a, a, quite a high bar statistically two out of every three medical students will be on some sort of either sleep prescription or natural sleep supplement two-thirds this is like early 20s and this is before residency which either you've lived it or have experienced it vicariously through like Grey's anatomy or something else similar that's like 80 hours a week and like the most, it's like having a puppy for three years. Okay. But like nowhere near as fun. And then, so it's disordered sleep at that level here. Okay. Now I don't have the statistics offhand, but like in terms of whether it's friends, patients, people saying, you know, my, my little one, my son, who's like maybe eight cannot sleep without melatonin. An eight year old. I mean, that's why, like, this is literally why melatonin gummies are like one of the like <laughs> they're just like widespread now you walk down cvs like an aisle or like a walgreens like you're gonna run into a wall of them 
uh, because like the, the sleep of kids have just completely been destroyed. Okay. Now the reason for this are going to be things like screens. Okay. And yeah, we could talk about a lot of other different factors. Like this is one of the number one big things. Cause if we compare like, say what my eyes were exposed to when I was younger, which was mainly TV, maybe I'm going to date myself a little bit, but there was something called a Nintendo 64. Okay. Like that was, if anyone knows, I, I just feel weird asking that now. Right? <laughs> <laughs> At least it's not an Atari. Well, yeah, for the 64, that was the game console after me because I was the regular Nintendo, the gray box. The what that does to like a growing adolescent is completely destroy something known as their circadian rhythm, which is just the timing of their body's internal clocks. Okay. Now, one of the things that I first really appreciate about my parents when I moved away from home was my dad's ability to keep the four clocks in the house all at the same time, okay? I don't know how he did it because when, like, when I moved out, it was like, the oven says this, the hallway clock says this, and my alarm clock says this. What time is it really? Like existential crisis, okay? Your body has a clock in every single cell, trillions of cells. Hard as it is to maintain you know, oven and alarm clock synchronicity, your, your body has a challenge of making sure every cell is on the same page. Every single time, like say a high schooler on their cell phone at night, if it's like the sun is down, they're on a cell phone, like that's throwing off their clocks. Okay. Whether, you know, I, I see this all the time. Obviously I have never had a, a small child. I'm not going to judge, but just quite simply when uh, we have a generation many times raised by iPads. Okay. It's very easy to be like, here you go. But what that's doing when you're sending a signal to a very young retina and brain, that's going to desynchronize the clocks. And the thing is, it's very different for you and I, okay? And by you and I, I mean adults. I'm gonna, we're going to represent all adults at large here. When we get light that disrupts our clocks, it, does, it only really affects us that day. Yes, it has a carryover effect into the next few days, but it's really isolated, so to speak. When a child, okay? especially less than like eight years old, when they get exposed to artificial light at the wrong time, that is going to have pretty much a very long lasting effect. Because during those times, those years rather, that's when someone's like chronotype is being like programmed. And that's like the sort of the timing of when they're kind of be most active, et cetera, here. But if it gets like destroyed because of a constant screen, it's going to mess it up. Okay. So that's why whether it's bigger reliance on like sleep supplements in young kids, whether it's this like this sudden really weird emergence of pediatric sleep apnea. Okay. Did anyone really hear of that a whole lot like 10 years ago? No. But now it's like, I think I hear about someone I know whose kids have it like maybe every two to three weeks. And I don't know that many people to be honest. <laughs> it, it's just becoming more and more widespread because like a lot of this technology and the screens impacting a very uh, plastic, impressionable neurophysiology. It's so interesting. As you said, like the melatonin gummies, like everywhere, like they even have bubble bath for, for people and kids for, I don't know how effective it is, but there is a bubble bath with like melatonin. It's like, it's like on the label. And it was so funny because I was going down the aisle of, of my local grocery store and I saw it and I was like, really, huh? That, that's so interesting because I understand what melatonin does, but it's a natural thing your body does in the darkness. So as soon as it starts to get dark, we have blackout curtains in the house. So like it gets real dark in our room. So we don't have TV. We don't have much technology in the room. We just have uh, our alarm clock. And from there, we can you know set the alarm, whatever. We're good to go. But I know when I was in college, I had a TV in my room and I had the worst sleep in college, not only because of stress and anxiety, but because the TV was always on. And even if the TV wasn't on, it just felt like it needed to be on. It was just like, it was the weirdest feeling. And I can imagine what kids are going through now, because if they are going to be on their iPads, their phones, and I mean, I think the youngest age I ever saw a kid get a smartphone was like seven. So I'm like, whoa, that's, that's pretty early to have a smartphone. But it is almost one of those necessities now for parents to know where their kids are at all times. 
And it's a great thing to have, but this is going to be so much more than just sleep issues with them because now they're just literally hunching over all day. And now they're having like these like spine issues because they're literally arched over. I, I was going to the gym one morning. This is probably like a year ago at this point. Everyone at the bus stop was just literally hunched over on their phone. And I was just like, talk to each other in my head, but different times. So we are just in different times now where might have to accept this as the norm, but it's not the norm. As you said, you see it so much more readily happening in the youth because maybe parents are so busy. They're so inundated. Again, stress, anxiety. The easiest thing to do if you're a parent is to give them an iPad, is to give them a smartphone because it distracts them and it stops them from making you crazy. But it's something we practice in our household. No matter how hectic it can be, no matter how difficult it is, we don't just give them a phone. We just don't give them the iPad. All right. There's certain times we do. We have a very young one. And the only reason we give them an iPad is to help them learn languages. And everything that they watch is all about learning languages because it's about the immersion. Think about it. If you go to a new country and you don't speak to anybody, you'll never learn the language. And when you're growing up, you're trying to immerse yourself into a world that you're, you know, it's your first time in. And for many people, they just give the kids the device, but it doesn't have any purpose. So now they're playing video games. They're just doing these brain dead things. And it's very addictive to them because now they feel like they need it. And there's so many studies on the attention span of children let alone the sleep cycles that are causing so many problems. But let's fast forward. These kids that are growing up in this cycle of this technology, of already harming themselves, not getting adequate amounts of sleep. Of course, we already know you need to sleep in order to grow and to heal and to repair. How is that going to affect them in 20 years? What's your work going to look like? Oh, man. So what, like 20 years from now, what are these kids going to look like? Oh, man. I mean, there's a lot of things going on in America. But one of the scariest things, that's kind of funny. I had to pick the scariest thing in America. <laughs> there's not an obvious, just one. But for the first time, I think ever, okay, maybe there's some other time, but the, one of the first and most very recent times, life expectancy is going down. Okay, so if you were to look at a graph, it's typically going up and like now like, you know, it plateau and then kind of it's not crashing down, okay? Not every, not everyone's dropping their 45, but like with advances in, like paradigm, the thought is with advances in medicine, improvements in health and lifestyle, et cetera, that should be going up, okay, right? There's blue zones of entire people where people are very often super centenarians living 100 plus, right? But yet here in America, what's going on? And yes, we could attribute that to diet is gonna play a huge part, lifestyle is gonna be a huge part. But the thing is, the reason, the people who are going to their 50s, okay, are not going to be as energetic or anywhere near close as like vibrant as people in their 70s right now. It's going to be because of what happened in their 30s. Does that make sense? It is delayed by a significant amount. Now, let's say we focus on the youth here. Like, I mean, it's really take your pick. You want to look at mental health. We could argue that diagnosis is, has gone up. It has. Diagnostic tools have gone up. But the thing is, like, when you actually calculate it out, prevalence is way higher on top of that okay so it's not just from overlooking at things like whether it's autism adhd whether we're talking about bipolar depression anxiety those are all going much much higher in younger age cohorts because typically whether you happen to be an epidemiologist because you're that's just what you do or you know you're really interested in health you're a doctor usually when we say certain diseases there's like a an age bracket we have in mind okay like say rheumatoid arthritis, oh, you know, 65 plus, right? Like so something of that nature. Those are all shifting down by like a decade, okay? And that's like right now. When we sort of project that out, because already we're seeing chronic diseases develop younger and younger and younger. Diabetes, okay, we don't even have to talk about obesity. That's, that's an easy one. But like things like diabetes, autoimmune, all these things are happening at younger and younger ages right now, okay? It's like, you and I at that Nintendo 64 level <laughs> of exposure. But now like the diseases that are going to manifest, like this is going to take a sharp term, but like it, it's going to be really unprecedented, I think, in terms of the disease burden, how it's going to be managed. I'm not sure really anyone knows because like mental health is already a big declining part of it. 
in terms of physical health. I'm not really sure what the ramifications will be for that. But also, and we're going to get really sort of global on this, like when you look at certain societies, because certain societies will adapt technologies far sooner than others. Okay. So like we think the whole cell phone thing with kids here is really bad. Like that was like Japan, like 15, like they're like, oh, you're behind (laughs) sort of thing. But what does Japan have? Okay. Besides arguably more sushi. I'm not sure if that's actually true. I would have to look at the per capita data on that. But with that, there's something known as like celibacy syndrome in Japan. Okay. Which sounds made up, but it's true. It's where the population growth has declined so much because men like who are younger, 18, 25, 30 beyond, they're so physiologically busted to put it nicely, I guess. They're not even interested in either sexual relations or they're contributing to like fertility issues. Okay. And that comes from, because when we think about like, okay, fertility, libido, that's going to come back to hormones. Okay. Hormones are going to be directly linked to your body's circadian rhythm. Okay. Testosterone, it's made more in the morning, right? So when that gets like thrown off, then that's going to have downstream effects and ripple effect and all that. Are things going to get scary and everything's going to look like movie Wally? I don't think it'll get that bad, but will we have an unprecedented burden disease and people who are, you know, maybe in their teens now? I think absolutely. I really do think there will be a significant decline in the physical capacity of modern countries. But don't freak out. (laughs) I don't know how to end on an uplifting note. I mean, we still have a conversation ahead, so we definitely are going to find the uplifting note. But we do have to look at everything. And I did hear about that issue with the men in in Japan. And I think there's a place in Japan, I forget the city or the town, where they have some of the oldest people living there. And like they have like a very particular diet of eating like fish and like green tea and stuff. But they have a high life expectancy, but they're just not pushing out enough babies right now. And this could be an issue with smartphones. It could be just a global issue. I'm not necessarily sure. I'm not an expert at that. I really haven't even dived into that. But what I can talk about is I can ask you the question, well, what are we going to do about it? What should we do about it? Because I'm sure you probably have a couple of ideas of things that maybe we can implement, things maybe parents should be doing with their kids, adults should be doing today in their life instead of what they are doing. What is the first step? Yeah, I think the first step, Ty, I don't know we talked about earlier, is being able to use technology as a tool as opposed to like a a default, right? When the next time you go on social media, I want everyone to pause, okay, and ask yourself, why am I here, okay? Just catch yourself in a moment. Like, what outcome am I trying to achieve, right? Because like, if you go into your kitchen, you may have a very specific outcome. You're going to cook breakfast, right? But when we go on social media it's almost this autopilot thing. Like you're scrolling and you're like, why are there these pictures of cats? What's going on here? Like, okay, now I'm reading. Like we have to kind of slow down and recognize to what end are we sort of using this tool for? Okay, because like we're using this tool to communicate and talk about this and someone will hear this and have insights and take different actions. But like it first comes in that awareness of like, what am I using this for? And what need am I trying to achieve here? Okay, because when you kind of break it down, technology, these screens, these lights, it is the equivalent of like, if we talk about like what it does for your body physiologically, it's like the fast food of neurostimulation, right? Because back in my day for like, can't even say that, but you would get like a dopamine hit from like talking to someone, right? Like a physical game, right? Or I really want some thrill and excitement. Let's play chess, there would be this delayed dopamine hit, which is therapeutic, right? Now it is addictive, okay? Like you get bored of what we're talking about. It doesn't take you like too many thumb flicks to be able to play like Angry Birds if that's even still relevant. I don't know if it is, but like something, some game like that to get a quick dopamine hit, okay? And it becomes like the fast food because when we think about, you know, staring into a light or the screen or like maybe I click around all over the place, it's going to give me a certain dopamine hit, just like a uh, slot machine would. 
but it's not going to have all these other profound effects. That's why I call it like fast food. Cause like you could eat McDonald's and you won't die today, but like, obviously you want to be able to have like more nutritious food that may not be as convenient. It may not be as really convenient. I don't really find fast food <laughs> particularly delicious, but that the same thing with technology here, where it becomes this like sort of quick hit here. So when you're really in it, it's asking yourself like, what am I looking for? Okay. Cause only kind of six categories, really the two, we don't need to get every single one of them, but it's going to be like variety and connection. That's like what people are looking for. Okay. Like you're not going to talk to the person at the bus stop. Cause you're like, I can just WhatsApp so-and-so, right. Or I can Facebook answer this person. Can you mean that need for connection variety? Okay. There is a reason if people want to Google this later and be like, what does this doctor spend his time all day searching? The social media algorithms are actually based upon the neurochemistry of slot machines. So what I mean by that is you don't always win big, okay? You lose enough times. You're like, Susie, boring, Tim, whatever. Oh, what did Jody post? So like it tries to figure out what is the optimal interval to keep you scrolling and addicted to stimuli. That's what, take your pick, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok. (laughs) <laughs> and then there's other ones, but they're all designed to like meet that need for variety in that way. Now, then the second question needs to be like, how else can I meet this? Okay. How how else can I have variety right now? Could it be now you play backgammon if anyone still knows what that is, but like, or learn a language, right? That's going to be a lot of variety. Being able to recognize like what that need is and like, what is an alternative, more healthy way to meet that? Okay. And, and this really coalesces because like a lot of you know when we're working with our people it's a lot of lifestyle and habit changes right and like this you know a little scrolly scrolly it's one of the the worst ones you can have like okay obviously like you can be smoking cigarettes and all that don't get me <laughs> I, I would hope we're beyond that <laughs> this year but like because if you're doing that at like midnight you're telling your brain it's the middle of the day and then that's going to lower melatonin it's going to raise cortisol it's going to throw off your sleep you can't your body can't heal the next day is ruined your brain damages it more self the next day. And then like, it, it just creates this cascade just from like, well, I just need to calm down and play Farmville or whatever. I'm not sure if that's a thing either, but it just has such a big effect. So being aware is number one. And then two, being able to first like, okay, how else can I need this? Because that starts to shift you out of it. When we look at sleep, I think people know the good things and the bad things. For example, coughing before sleep, bad. Drinking before sleep, bad. Eating three hours before sleep, bad, right? They know what is bad. But when it comes to technology, it's a different conversation. It's so normalized. It's like, on my phone all day. So if I'm on my phone at night, it's, it's no really phase to me. Like, I'm not saying this is bad for me. Or if I'm spending three hours on social media, Technically, you're probably not going to say this is bad for me. Maybe it's entertaining. Maybe it's whatever for you. But most people are not going to associate that with bad. And as you said, we have to treat it more like a tool. You're not going to just be walking around with a, with a toolbox all day with your screwdrivers and your wrenches. But yet, you know, people are using this phone like, oh, I'm going to use every single moment of my day. I'm just going to walk around with it. It's a great tool. But you don't need it all the time. Sometimes just looking up, just, you know, talking to a person. I was at the gym today and there was a lady who needed some help with the machine and she went to the wrong guy. I was going to say she went to the wrong guy. The guy has his headphones on. He's totally checked out, not living in the moment. He's just like worried about whatever he has to do. And so she went over there, maybe explained for about 40 seconds saying that she needed help. And I'm just there, just watching, just observing. And eventually he goes over there, moves the machine for her. He he doesn't set it right for her. And then kind of goes off and does his own thing. And he's just totally distracted on his phone type of thing. It wasn't so much of listening to music only. He did have headphones on, but he was more on his phone. Typically when I'm in the gym, I might check an email or something along those lines because I just have downtime in my 30 seconds. I'll do it. I don't mind. But he was totally checked out. And this is what people do. They just totally check out. They say, you know what? Wherever I go, the gym, the movies, I don't care. I can be with my loved one sitting on the sofa and I'm going to be checked out. And that is what people are doing. People are checking out, but they don't even have the ability to check in. 
So their phone is literally the obstacle from them to getting good sleep, to them having good relationships, to them having a healthy body and a healthy mind. I mean, there's just so many issues that come with that. And sleep is one of them. And people don't realize just how important sleep is. There was a time when I just couldn't sleep. It was just, I just didn't want to sleep. And eventually my body was like, you're going to go to sleep. And then I, I just, I didn't have a choice. I was like, all right, I'm going to sleep. And I don't know if you ever stayed up for like 48 hours, you start to see things like it's just like you start to go crazy. It's like, like, did I see something? But that's just our body saying, hey, we need some time to refresh. And if you think about a computer, it does updates. If you think about your phone, it has updates. If you ever run into a problem, guess what? Restarting it helps. But yet we don't do that for ourselves. We just go, 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 go. We're so busy. And we do have the power of youth right now. And typically, I, I say youth for anyone 45 below. Anyone who's 45 and up, I'm not saying you're old yet, but you do have to be more careful. This is all I'm saying. And if you are going to use your youth and just squander it away and just say, you know what, I'm just going to do this now because it feels good. I'm going to not focus on sleep or my nutrition because it feels good. It's easy. It's convenient. As you said, fast food just makes you slow later on. And it doesn't necessarily, and you're right, it doesn't taste good, but people will still do it. They know the phones are not necessarily good for them, but they don't put so much attention to it. As the things I said earlier on, coffee, alcohol, smoking, right? Those things they know about. They might even stay away from it, but yet the most addictive thing we have right now that is harming us is our phone, is technology, is the TVs, is our Netflix and our Hulus and all of the games that we could be playing. We live in a world of comfort and what we have to do is we have to learn how to be more comfortable with ourselves, with our natural rhythms of our world and our mind, because if we don't, we're going to have to be checking you out, Dylan, and saying, hey, I can't sleep. And then one of the first things you're going to ask is like, well, why can't you sleep? And this is the problem that we're facing right now. The thing is, when it eventually gets to that point, because like when I had my health issues long, long ago, like my sleep falling apart was like the first thing that happens, right? Now that happening, eventually it reaches a point of where then there'll be like other collateral damage, right? It's like really rarely ever sleep. Now metabolically, blood sugars are high, right? Or autoimmune processes are kicking off, right? The reach is a certain point where like it is a point of no return and like by the time you really feel like i cannot sleep like when someone's saying that I'm like okay like what else we got going on here because like it, it rarely is ever i mean like it could be a short-term thing puppies new babies like i didn't sleep well the other night because there was like tornadoes in the area kind of hard to sleep okay talk about anxiety you know earplugs can't block that out it just becomes something where you need to be able to really like make it like your number one priority because a lot of times people get caught up in the mindset of let me take this drink or like a, like there's like sleep supplements that are just like a drink, gummy or, or a pill or something like this will fix my sleep. Oh, GABA, right? But the thing is like, what you do throughout the day affects your sleep, right? Because like you went to the gym this morning, right? That is very clearly associated, like being physically active in the morning is very clearly associated with better sleep quality at night, right? Or maybe, you know, whether it's having like mind body practices in place, you do 20 minutes a day, doesn't matter when the heck you do that. It, that'll again, improve sleep quality. Or maybe you get outside. I know it's sometimes a foreign concept for the younger gen. I'm joking. Well, kind of not, I guess, at this point. You know, just being able to have like natural light, that's going to, again, help your circadian rhythm during the day and then affect things at night with sleep. So like you, you need to be able to zoom out and see, not just sleep as like, say you want to go to bed at like 10 p.m. Like, all right, it's 945. All right, what can I do for my sleep? Like it's, it's really like, it's a whole day, whole body event here. So I think the more people can see it like that, because when the more and more we look at things in isolation, for instance, like one of your kids has like a meltdown, it's not like, oh, this probably has nothing to do with what happened the last like <laughs> four days or whatever. Like it, oh, it is, it, it, it's an culmination of events that will then show up in a way where you're like, oh, gee, this is a problem. But by the time you identify the problem, it, it's time to like kind of take it seriously like then and there as opposed to like, well, Maybe the third time I don't sleep well and I don't think take this seriously. It's it's being able to like, okay, what small things can I start to do and, and stack upon now sort of deal. And if your kid is having a tantrum or a meltdown, most likely they need a nap whenever my kid is losing it. 
I go, wait, how many naps did he have today? He needs to have at least two. You know, he's only one. For me, it's just like sleeping for him, priority. And it should be a priority for everyone at any age. Because if you're going to be sacrificing your sleep, and I'm not saying that you need to be a person that says, I always need to have eight hours of sleep. Because not everyone is going to need eight hours of sleep. Some people are different. Some people can operate on six or on seven. Some people need 10. It just depends on the person, depends on lifestyle, what you're trying to do. And if you can commit to that. But I will say eight is just a good static number to always say, all right, I'm going for eight. I like six and seven. That just works better for me. If I do eight, if I, I feel too tired after. But that's just me. All right. Everyone, you just have to figure out what works for you. And then you have to figure out the things that are causing you not to get sleep. When I hit my bed, I'm out. Uh, it, there is no like, hmm, let me think about something as like, I don't have time for that. And that right there is going to lead to you waking up, being more purposeful in your day versus, all right, I got to go to work. All right, I got to get up and go to the gym. Okay, let me reach for my phone. You're doing all these poor choices in the morning because you're not thinking clearly. And you might not know that you're not thinking clearly because it becomes a habit. If you have a bad habit of sleeping, if you have a bad habit or bad relationships with technology, you need to figure out what's going on. And the conversation that Dylan and I had today is going to be that gateway for you to ask the questions. Hey, this is going on in my life. What is something I can do today or in the next three months that, are, that will help me get back to my sleep cycles, to help me to get back to where I need to be? And I think we talked about many great aspects and topics that people can do today, but I always find that things can be individualized. As you said, we don't know everyone's situation. They can have a dog, they can have a cat, they can have a baby, they can have a new job. We don't know your situation. So that's why talking to an expert like Dylan, with, you know, when it comes to sleep, he's going to be able to look at all the nuances of your life and then begin to give you the best plan for you to get back to a better health, better body, better mind. It just happens all because you slept better. So as we begin to wrap up, Dylan, I would love for you to give us some final words and then to tell the audience where they can find you. Yeah, so some final words. Being able to take like like small tangible action steps, I guess we'll kind of do three here. And these are all things you can do for $0 and three payments of $0. How about that? We'll do it in installments, make it, you know, stretch it out. One thing like lower light at night is a thing, but if you don't already have blue blockers, don't worry if you don't. But one thing that like everybody can do, you can just wear sunglasses at night. It achieves a similar effect. It's not as convenient or as truly effective as say blue blockers, but just like wearing sunglasses where it's like two hours for a bed. Yes, you'll look really cool too, but also it'll help with your natural melatonin secretion at night. It's like literally if you own sunglasses, which I would quite a few people do, uh, that's something you can easily do. Okay. So that's like tonight. Okay. I'm assuming you're watching this exactly when we're recording a live stream. <laughs> <laughs> now, morning time, you, you want to get like 10 minutes out in the sun, you know, between like eight to 10 AM. Okay. They're going broad on the latitude here, depending on when, you know, the sun is up, but just doing that will then set your rhythm up for the day and also help at night. Okay. Thing number three is you want to allow like a good like three to four hours between last time you ate and going to bed. Uh, that one can have different considerations. Like what if I'm starving before? Okay, then maybe like, you know, don't follow that sort of easy one. But a lot of times people are eating like too heavy, too close to bed. And then, you know, that's going to hurt your sleep quality. It'll raise insulin and then that lowers melatonin. Okay. And then one of the easiest things when you're laying in bed, because for people who don't just like head on pillow out, um, uh, is being able to really the simplest things like I think box breathing is a really good one because one and this is when you inhale for a five count pause for a five count exhale for a five count pause for a five count you just cycle through that okay one when you do that breathing pattern it relaxes your nervous system and also it is the it's perhaps like the easiest form of meditation you can do because you're not thinking about what you should have said seven hours ago you're just like one two three, four. So it's like a forced meditation. If just following your breath is, is a, you find you want too much. You can do that and literally drift off to sleep doing that. And also it'll help your breathing at night as well. Be a lot more effective. So you have deeper sleep. I think we had four. Those are my wise words. And where do people find me? 
the internet of course on all these technologies like there's only one good use for social media and it's, it's well there's two finding me and you so uh either like probably the easiest way i do have a facebook group of, you know spending a lot of focus on one of the big areas uh near and dear to my heart sleep apnea so if you look up like sleep apnea solution on facebook you'll find our facebook group there you could also go to our instagram which is pekus md so p-e-t-k-u-s md as a medical doctor you know like daily tips there and all those different pieces those would be the best we have, we're on youtube as well do like longer episodes there but those are probably the best you know three places to find me okay and i'm going to make it easy for everyone all the links are going to be in, in the description box below people can check out they can go to their favorite social media platform because everyone has their favorite so <laughs> if you like facebook you got it if you just like searching on google you got it youtube same thing and the goal is going to be to help get you back to the sleep that you should be having if you're struggling with sleep if you're struggling with focusing on your morning because you just need your coffee first right that's a sure sign that you're not getting adequate amounts of sleep now i understand there could be some cravings that you just crave caffeine the coffee flavor okay teach your own but you should be waking up invigorated excited and able to attack your whole day with full of purpose and a mission that's going to lead you to a full and happy life all right, everyone, I'd like to thank you so much for watching that interview with Dylan and myself. As you can see, the conversation that we had is just a fun, super chill flow conversation about his work. It's not necessarily talking about too much medical lingo. It's just about presenting it in a way that everyone, no matter the age, can understand. Because our devices, our smartphones, our TVs and stuff, we might not know that is getting in the way of good sleep. And I remember when I moved to Texas from Connecticut, one of the things I told myself is that there's not going to be any TVs in the room. There's not going to be any electronics. The room is just for sleeping. When I first got to Texas, I think I developed sleep inertia. And sleep inertia is like when you just can't get up. And there was a couple of factors for that. The first factor is I did not sleep all prior really well to coming to Texas. I just wasn't sleeping well. When I finally got to Texas and I got a new mattress, and I'm talking about this is a really good mattress, it was like, good night. That was it. When I woke up, I just wanted to keep on sleeping. My body was trying to catch up on all the nights that I did not sleep. And I'm talking about I would stay up until 5 o'clock in the morning, sleep until 9, go get breakfast, and then stay up again until five o'clock in the morning. There weren't any naps. So I was operating on maybe three to four hours of sleep a day, and that is not healthy for me. That is not how much sleep I needed. I needed a lot more. I needed about seven to eight hours at that time, and I wasn't giving myself that sleep because I was going through the ringer. I was going through the gauntlet. I was going through all of these emotions that sometimes you just want to distract yourself with and sleep is not what that distraction was. I wanted to be on my phone. I wanted to be on the TV. I wanted to do all these things that weren't benefiting me. And so 2016, when I came to Texas, 2017, started to fix my sleeping patterns, going to the gym more readily in the mornings. Everything started to shift. And then 2018, started the business coaching and session. 2021, I think, around there. We have been making progress from that day, from me coming to Texas, from me just changing my lifestyle and me saying there's going to be certain aspects of my life that I'm going to hold true to. And there's going to be certain aspects of my life that I'm going to get rid of. And I got rid of the TVs. I got rid of all the technology. And it wasn't until where you, now you have a business, you have to have a little bit of social media presence. So I am very particular and how I spend my time on social media. Yes, I will respond to messages. I actually don't get any notifications for social media. I turn them all off because if I did, I would be inundated. My mom's phone, she's probably going to kill me for this. My mom's phone, she has all the notifications on. And the only thing you see in her top bar is just Facebook, this and that. And I'm like, Jesus, how can you function with all those notifications? All of those distractions. For me, I said, I'm going to get rid of all of them. And then that's why I have my social media managers, my content managers, my video managers, my community managers. This is because I don't necessarily need to invest 
that time in social media on my phone to get addicted trying to reach everybody. I will reach people. All of my employees that work for me, they're trained to say, hey, this person needs you. And I will intervene, basically. Unless that's the case, I have someone speaking on my behalf for the team, for the business. Because most of the things that you can learn about here at Reverend Concepts, you can find on the website. You can find from listening on the podcast. You can understand what we do. But for some people, they need some help. They need a consultation. They need to ask the questions. And those people are the people who should be asking for help, who should be asking the questions. And this is why I love having other experts, doctors, coaches come on because we get to talk about what they do and how they help people. Because I help people with mindset. I help people with their life, different nuances of their life. And Dylan, he helps people with their sleep patterns, getting back to good sleep, changing some of those habits that they might have been falling into and they're trying to fall out of. This is so important because there are many things that happen during sleep that you have no idea are happening. Number one, you're growing, you're repairing. Number two, you're getting sane. Your brain is going to be stretching, pulling. Think of like reading a book. If you read a book and you stay awake, it's cool and all. But when you go to sleep, your brain gets a chance to divvy up that information. Now it can process it. So when you wake up, now your brain is more focused, especially if you do it at different times, right? We didn't necessarily get into this aspect, but when you read can be a determining factor if you're going to know something or in how you're going to wake up in the morning. Sleep is essential. It is important. But then we have to look at knowledge too. What are we doing? And then what can we do instead? Because if you are a person that's just addicted to your smartphone and now you're like, okay, 10 o'clock, I need to be going to sleep, but I'm stuck on my smartphone. Maybe you just got a new lover and now you're talking like you were back in high school. This is, these are all possibilities. But the honeymoon phase is going to fade away eventually, but the habit typically doesn't. So we do have to make ourselves aware of the habit and to give ourselves better habits. Reading a book, writing, write down the 10 things you have to do the next day. If you can't sleep at night, write down the 10 things you have to do. Now, two things can happen. Number one, you're going to panic and you're like, oh my God, I have to do all these things. I can't sleep. At that point, just get up and do them. Eventually, you're going to get into the habit of doing them during the day. Most people, believe it or not, don't do enough in their day. And by the time they finally get to nighttime, they're not tired. You should be exhausted. When your head hits the pillow, if not, you have not given your all. I have talked about this on the podcast. I have talked about it on Motivation and Emotion, the video series that we have. This is an aspect to your life. You don't have to feel exhausted during the day, but at the end of the day, you should feel exhausted because you have done so much. Most people are not doing enough. We all have 24 hours in a day, but yet many people are not living the life that they want to, the dream life that they can be living because they are giving themselves the aspect of, well, there's no time. I can't go to the gym. I can't read. What are you spending your time on? Because if you work eight hours, if you commute two hours, that means you still have plenty more time to sleep, to eat, to socialize. But yet how much of that time is used frivolously? on TV, smartphones, wasting time away, just looking at the ceiling. I can't tell you how many people just look at the ceiling. Maybe you put something up there like a nice picture or a cat or a dog and you love it. It's a possibility, but most people waste their days away. What separates people who achieve wildly successful lives from the people who don't is how they utilize their time. And then they also have figured out what type of sleeping patterns they need. I know there are certain CEOs that they would do a 30-minute nap, a 45-minute nap or whatever, and that right there is enough for them during the day. So they will go to sleep at night, four hours, whatever it is, and then they'll take a nap during the day. That works for them. Now, at some point, will they get more sleep? I almost guarantee they will. No person that is just operating on four hours of sleep is not going to catch up at some point. Now, they might operate the majority of their week saying, I'm going to wake up at four o'clock in the morning. I'm going to only get four to five hours of sleep. And maybe they take a nap. But one day they're going to sleep 
a little bit later on that nap, one day they're going to get an extra nap in because their body's trying to catch up. Whether you're in that catch up phase or if you're just in that phase of trying to figure out what works for you, the best advice I can give you is to make sure that you don't go alone, to make sure that you have someone in your corner that can be making sure you're not building the bad habits, doing the wrong things, so you can focus on the things that are going to build you up. This is a concept that people love trial and error, but I'm telling you not to love trial and error at every point in your life. Trial and error is cool. It is maybe essential in some regards, but when it comes to your body, your mind, you should be seeking out advice, mentorship, medical advice, leadership, trying to figure out what you need and how you need to operate. Because we're operating right now on empty. Most people are just empty. You don't have to be that. You don't have to operate on empty. You don't have to operate in a deficit. This is something that you can take control of today. So if you're not getting good sleep, if you're not living the dreams that you can in your day because you're too tired to, maybe you should be reaching out to someone who can help you. We have had so many wonderful sleep specialists come on the podcast. Dylan is one of them. And he is so much fun. He's so cool. Just talking, you can just see, hey, this is how it is, right? It's not going to be, hey, you're doing bad. And I know sometimes doctors get a bad rap because, hey, you should be doing this. And it's almost like you're getting a list of all the things that are wrong that you have to fix. And it can be a hard pill to swallow. But as you can see, super chill, super calm. And it's almost like, hey, take it or leave it at this point. If you are ready and you're willing to change your sleep patterns in your cycle and you need help with that, the links are going to be in the description box below. Reach out to Dylan. If you need help with mindset, reach out to us here at Reverend Concepts. We'll be more than happy to get you back on track to where you need to be. My name is Michael Reardon. I'm a mindset coach. If you have any questions, email me coachinginsession at gmail.com. And I will see everyone on the next episode of Coaching In Session. Until then, everyone take care.